coming up on Network Africa. 13 die after consuming toxic porridge in Namibia. Sudanese uh, regular army withdraws from truce talks, citing non-commitment of the RSF. Plus, World Food Programme completes first food distribution in Khartoum, laments 17,000 metric tons of food lost to looting. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Melissa Walker in Lagos. We begin with sad news in Namibia where 13 people have died in the span of three days and four others have been admitted to hospital in critical condition after eating suspected toxic food. Local media reports that all are from a household of 22 people in Kayova village in northeastern Kavanga region. Most of the dead who are children are said to have been in dire need of food for some time. The Ministry of Health has deployed a team of workers to provide psychosocial support and counselling to the bereaved family, while several samples of the porridge have been dispatched to South Africa for testing. Now to the situation in Sudan. Reports say the Sudanese army has suspended its participation in ceasefire talks with its paramilitary rival. According to a government official, the army took the decision because the rebels have never implemented a single one of the provisions of a short-term ceasefire, which requires their withdrawal from hospitals, residential buildings and have repeatedly violated the truce. Both the army and the rival paramilitary rapid support forces have not commented on the said withdrawal. Both sides had agreed to extend a week-long ceasefire deal by five days, just before it was due to expire late on Monday. Sudanese Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan appeared in a video released Tuesday greeting soldiers and delivering a speech. In the video, he tells them that the army had agreed to a ceasefire extension to ease citizens' access to services. Quote, we still have not used maximum force, he tells the chairing soldiers, but we will be forced to do so if the enemy does not obey or listen to the voice of reason. Burhan was speaking in an undisclosed location. The army and the paramilitary rapid support forces, RSF, agreed to extend the week-long ceasefire deal by five days just before it was due to expire. The truce was brokered and is being remotely monitored by Saudi Arabia and the United States, which say it has been violated by both sides, but has still allowed for the delivery of aid to an estimated 2 million people. Leaders of the army and the RSF had held the top positions on Sudan's ruling council since former leader Omar al-Bashir was toppled during the popular uprising in 2019. They staged a coup in 2021 as they were due to hand leadership to the council to civilians before falling out over the chain of command and restructuring of the RSF under the planned transition. The UN World Food Programme, WFP, has announced a major breakthrough in Sudan where the aid agency has delivered food to families trapped in the war-torn capital, Khartoum, for the first time since fighting broke out. Speaking from the city of Port Sudan, WFP's country director, Eddie Rowe, warned at a press briefing in Geneva that food shortages could worsen as the lean season is fast approaching. He added that the WFP is planning to reach 5.9 million people across Sudan over the next six months. Sudan has witnessed deadly army armed clashes between the Sudanese army and the RSF in Khartoum and other areas since April 15, with the two sides accusing each other of initiating the conflict. Distribution of food assistance to Khartoum started on Saturday, the 27th of May, while we were able to provide food assistance to 15,000 Sudanese 
both in the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces controlled areas in Umduman, which is part of the Khartoum metropolitan area. Quite apart from the assessed 16 million people who would find it very difficult to, to afford a meal a day, this conflict compounded by the hunger season would increase the food insecure um, population by about 2.5 million people um, who definitely would slip into the hunger category in the coming months. Well, that's not all. Mr. Ediro is saying that about 17,000 metric tons of food aid have been lost to looting since the start of the fighting in Sudan six weeks ago. Uh, the UN and aid groups say that despite the truce, they have struggled to get bureaucratic approvals and security guarantees to transport aid and staff to Khartoum and other places of need. The WFP adds that it had begun three days of distributions in the capital on Saturday had reached more than 12,000 people in Omdurman in areas controlled by the army, as well as the RSF. UNICEF spokesman James Elder estimates that 13.6 million children in Sudan urgently need assistance. He added that hundreds of them have died. Unfortunately, so far, we've lost about 17,000 metric tons of food across the country, but particularly in the Dafus. Just two days ago, our main hub in Elobed is under threat, even though the food has not yet been looted, but we know that our office prefabs, our assets, and some of our vehicles have already been looted. Quite apart from the assessed 16 million people who would find it very difficult to, to afford a meal a day, this conflict compounded by the hunger season would increase the food insecure um, population by about 2.5 million people um, who definitely would slip into the hunger category in the coming months. More children today in Sudan require life-saving support than ever before. So we now have a staggering or a sobering 13.6 million children uh, in Sudan who urgently require assistance. That's more than the entire population of Sweden, of Portugal, um, of Rwanda. Hundreds of girls and boys have now been killed. Uh, and while we're unable to confirm these uh, due to the intensity of the violence, um, we also have reports that thousands of children have been maimed. Well, staying in Sudan and on the back of the conflict, chaos and neglect. We've heard there from the UN and WFP as saying that more children in Sudan require life-saving support now more than ever before. The staggering 13.6 million boys and girls requiring assistance urgently. Well, briefing journalist in Geneva, Elder said that the number represents more than the entire population of Sweden or Rwanda or Portugal, and that the number is growing. UNICEF has launched its new humanitarian action for children for Sudan and is calling for 838 million US dollars to address the crisis, an increase of 253 million US dollars since the current conflict began in April. Sudan's health sector is facing a looming collapse as infrastructure and hospitals in many cities were damaged or even completely destroyed by intermittent heavy fighting between the regular Sudanese armed forces and the RSF, the paramilitary rapid support forces. The escalating violence in the country in recent weeks has had a catastrophic impact on civilians. Despite the ceasefire agreement, with hundreds losing their lives and over 1.3 million people estimated to be displaced, and millions more now find themselves unable to access vital services or healthcare facilities. 
For more than four weeks, healthcare and medicine has not been available to patients in Khartoum and they have been forced to seek them in other places. Among those patients, Adam Abubakar said he had to walk for days to find a hospital and he finally reached help from doctors in Al Hashisha city, over 100 kilometers away from the capital. Meanwhile, the Hasahisa Hospital now works at maximum capacity to meet the daily needs of the increasing number of patients who come from Khartoum and other localities. And it has become one of the main health facilities in Sudan after the capital's destruction. Well, let's talk right now to VOA, VOA's uh, Africa correspondent, Mohamed Yusuf, who is speaking uh, online from Nairobi, Kenya. Hello, Mohamed. Good to see you. I mean, what do we make of what we're hearing? Has the truce failed and why the withdrawal by the army? Um, the, the, the Associated Press is quoting uh, the army spokesperson, Nabil Brigadier and uh, Nabil Abdallah, um, saying that they were pulling out of the talks because the RSF was not respecting the ceasefire. Uh, they have refused to leave or abandon um, um, civilian infrastructure, uh, homes and houses and, and, and some places in, in, in the capital. That is the main reason why they, they are pulling out of the talks. But uh, there were quite a lot of hope that uh, for five days uh, until Friday or Saturday that there will be more days of ceasefire, but that now has collapsed and that is not going to take place. That is what is generally going on, and uh, for the people who are uh, pretty much uh, hoping, trying to leave uh, their homes to safe areas or to out of the country, that is now uh, something that now they're going to struggle for civilians and humanitarians who are trying to who will be coming in and trying to provide assistance. That will be also a huge blow to them. But generally, um, much of the ceasefire was was to do with civilians, how to protect them, and uh, also uh, providing. Uh, humanitarian supplies that uh, many people need but uh, that talks now in Jeddah has uh, has collapsed uh, as, as it stands the army is not going to participate uh, in the talks um, that's so far what we know but uh, of course people are not giving up uh, and pushing uh, both uh, the RSF and the army to come together and continue to negotiate um, that is uh, so far what is what is going on in terms of truce so the fighting still goes on even if there was truce there were more fighting in in in, in the capital and uh, neighboring towns and cities and in other parts of the countries particularly in the east and Darfur region well, Mohammed, if we actually look at what the government officials said, uh, saying that the rebels have never at any point in time implemented a single one of the provisions of the short-term ceasefire, is that actually true? The, the problem with, 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 uh, with Sudan generally, past conflicts and now the conflict that is taking place, they, you can't confirm who is saying what and uh, uh, we, we understand the officials from the US and the Saudi who are following this truce or this ceasefire. They say that there have been counter, countless times that uh, this was violated and no one is, is, is saying who violated and what is going on. That is, uh, so far, there's never been, oh, this is, did this and that, that. That has been generally the conflict in, in Sudan and uh, there has been lack of accountability. And that's why even people agree to a ceasefire. They continue to fight and uh, they continue um, endangering civilians. So there's lack of that accountability. No one is providing exact who is doing what. And that is, uh, if you look at Sudan's history, that is something that is not surprising. That has been something normal. And in conflicts that, uh, that Sudan has, uh, past conflicts Sudan have experienced. But leaders, these same leaders, I mean, the regular army, the rapid support forces, RSF, they've worked together before, haven't they? Um, so why can they think of working together now? Actually, they work together, um, kicking out uh, the civilian side of uh, politicians or civil society who are actually helping them, trying to transition from the military to civilian rule. So they work together, kicking out the civilian side of the government. So at that time, they were very friendly. They were working together. But uh, after kicking the civilians, there are two of them now. And uh, if you look at it, it's, it's much to do with, with power struggle. And uh, Sudan is not very much different. The, the president who left, al-Bashir, uh, he was also a military man, but he just ended up dressing in a civilian, uh, putting his uh, military attire aside. But uh, 
And this is what you look, maybe these two gentlemen were trying to do, two generals were trying to do, because they've seen how Bashir was able to to keep up the country together, despite countless uh, progress, of course, there were challenges, but also there were abuses in many in parts of the country during his rule. And uh, there will be no accountability. There was ICC indictment, but uh, nothing ever happened. So it's, it's much to do with the two gentlemen. They're, they're used to it. The military has always been country's politics for decades since independence. So it's not surprising that the two men wanted to see who will get the power. And that's and, what uh, it's all about. Mohammed, one wonders how long they can prosecute um, the, this war. But finally, before we let you go, the World Food Programme is speaking of hundreds of thousands of tons of stolen food aid. Um, where do you think all the food is ending up? To answer the first question, I think it is much to do with that. Uh, you look at the generally what is happening in, in Sudan itself. They they cannot continue to fight, but I think much people, are con- a lot of people, are concerned with the break of lawlessness. And at times uh, now the negotiations about two sets of forces, and that is Sudan National Army and RSF. But if that goes now uh, beyond the fighting continues, is going you're going to have a civilian a civilian war, uh, civil war, of course, and then that is going to increase more people coming to the table, uh, tribal chiefs, warlords. You're going to create all that people coming. But it's easy now to stop. For, uh, just moving quickly to the question you asked about WFP. We are talking about, for the first time, WFP accessing uh, Khartoum and able to provide humanitarian supplies. And uh, the, that is what's been going on. But the, the looting has been going on and they, they've say, the, U, the UN agencies are saying that they're looting and they, the humanitarian workers are not able to access. They're also endangering their lives. But now something is also coming quite clear with this war. Now when the looting happens, the, after days of ceasefire, now there's looting. So it means that people who looted that, of course, uh, is not for the civilians. They're people who went with that, with that food. So it's going to create a the army and, of course, the RSF are going to have more food to continue fighting. We've seen that uh, the two-year conflict in Ethiopia, that is what has been going on. There were looting, the fighting continued, there was a ceasefire. It's, it's similar script we are seeing now in the region, uh, but time will tell if uh, maybe tomorrow in the coming days or weeks uh, they, the Sudan army will go back to the table and hopefully there will be um, some ceasefire and uh, civilians will, will, will get uh, a reprieve or uh, sort of uh, a normalcy to come back to the country. Hopefully, indeed, we'll keep monitoring the situation. Many thanks, VOA Africa's correspondent, Mohamed Yusuf. Thanks for talking to us. Still to come on the program. 40 killed in Burkina Faso attacks over the weekend. We have details in a moment. Welcome back. The UN Security Council has renewed an arms embargo and sanctions imposed on South Sudan for an additional year, including asset freezes and travel bans on some individuals. The council voted Tuesday to extend the embargo until May 2024, with 10 members voting in favour of the sanctions and five members abstaining. It directed all UN member states to prevent the direct or indirect supply, sale or transfer of arms to South Sudan. The continued intensification of violence prolonging the political, security, economic and humanitarian crisis in most parts of the country is a main concern of the Council. Countries that abstained are China, Russia, Ghana, Gabon and Mozambique. Ambassador Akwe Malwa from South Sudan protested against the vote, saying it was done in bad faith and ill intention. Despite a peace accord signed in 2018, violence continues, causing internal displacement of 2.3 million people. Reports from Burkina Faso say about 40 people were killed in two separate attacks by alleged jihadists at the weekend. About 20 army volunteers died near Barasso, uh, close to the Malian border on Saturday, while another 20 met their end in another attack in the same area on Sunday. Reports say dozens of insurgents were neutralized in an airborne operation by government forces following Saturday's violence. Burkina Faso's prime minister, Apolline Kayelem de Tembela has vowed never to negotiate with jihadists. 
More than 6,200 people were murdered in South Africa in the first three months of 2023, with about 245 children being victims of this. Police Minister Becky Sele released quarterly crime statistics in Cape Town on Tuesday. The majority of victims of the murder were men, followed by women, with an increase of 71 compared to the same period in 2022. These crime stats indicate that each day in the country, almost 70 people are murdered. The province of KwaZulu-Natal has again recorded the most murders, 1,589, followed by the province of Hauteng. Also a total of 10,512 rape cases were registered during the first quarter, which translates to around 116 cases of rape a day. Mr. Seller says these figures prompt them as the police to double up policing efforts to decrease constant crimes. It remains concerning that 10,512 people were raped in the first three months of this year. 4,768 of the rape incidents took place at the homes of the victims or at the home of the perpetrator. The declines and improvements in some crime categories are welcome, but should never be interpreted as victories. Crime in the country is still high and stubborn, and we are not about to stand down. The country and communities you serve need you, and you need them to fight and sweep away this common enemy of crime. That is a word from the police. This ministry is again calling on the whole government's whole, uh, government, whole society approach to fight. We again call on government and all levels to supporting policing efforts by addressing the country's drivers of crime. Without community participation, police will never win the war against crime. The improvement of the police visibility will remain our strongest arsenal. 1.8 billion has been allocated for the procurement of police vehicles to improve police visibility. The SEBS is also purchasing unmanned aerial vehicles or so-called drones to better police from the sky. More drone pilots are also being licensed and drone pilots intents are being recruited. Body one cameras as well as short spotters in high density crimes areas are being prioritized. Away from security in South Africa, Zimbabwean President Emerson Manangagwa has set August 23, 2023 as the date for the country's general election, including presidential and parliamentary polls. Tensions have been rising ahead of the vote, with the opposition Citizens Coalition for Change, Triple C, calling for an audit into the voters' role, citing missing names. The C is also alleging some of its officials and voters' polling areas have been moved several kilometres away from their wards of residence. The electoral body has said the ongoing voters' role inspection exercise will resolve some of the anomalies. Meanwhile, the Zimbabwean government has summoned the acting U.S. ambassador to the country over election-related social media posts, which it says amounted to activism and meddling in internal affairs. Last week, the U.S. embassy encouraged Zimbabweans to register to vote and make sure their voice is heard. In a statement, Zimbabwe's acting permanent secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Rofina Chikava, confirmed the meeting. Speaking to the U.S. Embassy's Chargé d'Affaires, Elaine French, she stated that the posts were unacceptable and deviated from diplomatic norms. A spokeswoman for the U.S. Embassy said there was no problem with the social media posts while also confirming the meeting between the two. On a trip to Burundi, Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said preparation for an intergovernmental deal on nuclear energy is in its final stage. Mr Lavrov made the remarks Tuesday after holding talks with Burundi's Foreign Minister Albert Shingiro in Bujumbura. The two countries signed a nuclear energy roadmap deal in November last year in which Russia agreed to assist Burundi to set up atomic plants. Mr Lavrov affirmed both parties are committed to cooperating with the peaceful use of nuclear energy. 
Mr. Shingiro reiterated that Burundi would not take sides in Russia's war against Ukraine. Before his departure for Mozambique, Lavrov met Burundian president uh, for further bilateral talks. The visit comes as part of Mr. Lavrov's tour of African nations following his recent trip to Kenya and ahead of his arrival in South Africa. And that's Central Africa at this time. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker.